I was writing about landscape without thinking about what it meant too much. But then I realized uh, after reading Dennis Cosgrove's book on uh, landscape that I needed to go into further detail. Well, Dennis Cosgrove had said that landscape basically was a concept invented in the Renaissance by, uh, through the application of methods of perspectival representation in art and that this is the origin of the meaning of landscape, meaning scenery as an art. Uh, and I was interested in this idea, but I was living in, I was teaching in Stockholm at the time, and I real, realized that the Swedes had a word landscape, which meant an area, a place. The word landscape originally referred to a kind of northern European polity and its place, which had its own laws, such as the landscape of Sweden, of Värmland, say. And then during the Renaissance, what happened is you see a great centralization happening uh, in Europe. And, and these landscapes became, well, in the Swedish case, they became lane. They became uh, territories uh, underneath the king, uh, less independent and more obligated to the, as, as administrative provinces, you could say. This process was also part of the mapping of Europe, so that what uh, to be in the 1600s and so on, to be a state, you had to have clear mapped boundaries. This was something new. And um, Sweden, of course, pioneered in this. And so you mapped the landscapes, but you also mapped the state. And uh, this process of mapping reduced, was part of the process by which these landscapes became subsumed to these states. Part of this process of mapping uh, required surveying, and the same techniques that are used to survey were also used to, if you tip, like if you have Google Earth, you just tip the downward view up and you get a, a landscape view. And so it's the same kind of space as, as with the map, only it's tipped up so you, you look down at the map or you can look sideways and see a, a landscape. And this is the scenic idea of landscape that emerges in the Renaissance. Both Danis Cosgrove and Steve Daniels uh, emphasized on this process as having to do with enclosure on the one hand, uh, uh, Schifte, your Schifte, Swedish, and uh, the development of art, uh, per perspectival artworks, as in museums and so on, often pastoral, and the application of these artworks to landscape gardening in, in Venice and in, particularly in England. It originally was a kind of place, and I emphasize on the role of the state in doing this. So my emphasis is more on the, it's the enclosure of the state, you might ask. And, and I focus more on the theater. The word scenery comes from the theater. So I focus more on the theater as the means of transposing this. But uh, I think it would be interesting to say that a third driver, which is less often uh, emphasized but has been noted, also by myself, is that is war. Inigo Jones is the person who developed the scenic technologies that were used to create scenery on the stage in the beginning of the 1600s, there, and it's the first time the word landscape is used to mean scenery. But Inigo Jones uh, also was the state surveyor, and he was doing uh, the defensive walls of cities. He was doing fortifications. And other people uh, involved with this kind of uh, uh, development of perspective were people like Leonardo da Vinci who also were very involved with making fortifications. When you're uh, aiming a cannon, uh, the techniques of the surveyor and of the cannon uh, men uh, orienting the cannon are very similar. Shooting cannons, creating defenses against cannons, and thinking in that way was very central to the development of perspectival uh, representational forms. Also, you could say, in the landscapes, tangible ones like fortifications. A lot of your landscape paintings are actually of battles and battlefields, and you have the expression theater of war. Dioramas that were made at the time of battles and so on, or the models that the, the, the kings and generals had made often were, you know, were landscapes. So landscape was a pioneer, in a way, uh, coming out of, out of warfare. And I think that this connection uh, between war and landscape uh, is arguably uh, persist to this day. Thus the development of the techniques of remote sensing have thus arguably been driven by war needs. Landscape is a wolf in sheep's clothing, you might say, because uh, it was very much about war as well, and, and even the landscape gardens were often built as at Stowe by famous generals who saw the trees as lines and marching and advancing, and so it was a real connection between war and landscape. I think a critical uh, view of landscape is important to environmental history because environmental history has, from the days of uh, Carl Sauer and uh, Darby, H.C. Darby and so on, landscape history 
and environmental history have gone together very closely. But that landscape was uh, always envisioned as a kind of scene, a scenic view of layers of scenery, uh, uh, the natural landscape at the bottom, like at the base of a stage, and then the cultural landscape above it and the climate above that. It's a kind of theater for human life is this way of thinking about landscape through history. It blinds you to the fact that nature, that landscape was originally uh, not a, a scenery controlled from a, a distance by a, a king viewing it from the stage or, or uh, someone with a remote sensing, but landscape was something that people did uh, through custom on the, uh, as, as in the ancient landscapes of Scandinavia. So that pe this was organized not according to the laws of the state, but according to the laws of local custom and landscape laws were like that. So if you want to understand uh, environmental history, I think you need to realize that there is the story of landscape understood as something emerging out of place and out of people's customs and interaction, and the other story of landscape, which is the top-down view of landscape as, as scenery, and that these are two somewhat in different but interconnected uh, landscapes. The, the way we represent our world semiotically or visually, uh, using central point perspective or not using it, all these things uh, are really very useful ways to understand and criticize. So it's important not to assume that there's just one landscape. The author I was focusing on never described, almost never described landscape in visual terms. He always was describing it in terms of the, the people and what they're doing. All his books are illustrated by landscape scenery, but he himself uh, was averse to doing that. He did it once in a very famous story where he was actually making fun of a poet who was doing it. And people now say, oh, this is wonderful, but it actually was a joke. That's the, that's the story of history. The jokes turn into reality.